Hello, thank you for joining us today for Hunt and Williams webinar, FCPA and Life Sciences, Why Are Companies Still Not Getting the Message? My name is Gary Mesplay. I am partner and co-chair of the firm's life sciences practice. We have had a tremendous response to our webinar invitation and we're glad that so many people could join us today. Before we, before we begin, let me first note that this event is in listen-only mode and is being recorded. The slides as well as a link to the recording will be circulated to all of the registered attendees. Please feel free to message any questions you may have throughout the program by selecting the chat icon in the ReadyTalk toolbar. Time permitting, we will answer your questions at the completion of today's presentation. And if we do not get to your question, a member of our team will follow up with you by email. Today's presenters include Hunton and Williams partner Tim Hafey, uh, who is chair of the firm's white collar defense and internal investigations practice. Prior to joining Hunton and Williams, Tim was the United States Attorney for the Western District of Virginia, serving as the chief law enforcement officer responsible for prosecuting federal crime and defending the United States in civil litigation. Tim's experience includes investigations and prosecutions in a broad range of subjects, including healthcare fraud national security, financial fraud, public corruption, international and national organized crime, environmental crime, money laundering, and civil rights. Also presenting today is Hunton and Williams partner, Wendell Taylor, who is a member of our global competition team. Wendell conducts compliance trainings, investigations, and counseling on a full spectrum of FCPA issues. Wendell also handles antitrust cartel matters, antitrust class actions, and merger reviews. Prior to Hunt and Williams, Wendell was a special, US, special assistant U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia, where he handled all aspects of trial litigation and post-trial motions and arguments. Wendell was also counsel to Deputy Attorney General Jim Comey at the Justice Department, where he helped the Deputy Attorney General oversee the civil, tax, and civil rights divisions, along with various other DOJ components, including the Community Relations Service, the Parole Commission, and the Office of the Pardon Attorney. Today's presentation uh, will be focused on the DOJ and SEC's continued emphasis on FCPA issues in the life sciences arena. This webinar will help you understand the mechanics of the act and how it's been applied to healthcare companies. We will also discuss the need for companies doing business abroad to have a robust training and compliance program to ensure awareness of the FCPA and other regulatory requirements. With that introduction, I will turn it over to Tim and Wendell, who will cover the inner workings of the FCPA. Gary, thanks. Good uh, morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. We're glad that you could join us to talk about this important issue. Uh, we thought we'd start with a quote from Lanny Brewer, who was the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division for the first, I think it was uh, four or five years of the current administration, and he explicitly said what we know is true from uh, case resolutions, and that's that in the FCPA area, there's a real focus on uh, health care companies. Lanny said, the depth of government involvement in foreign health systems combined with fierce industry competition and the close nature of many pub public formularies creates a significant risk that corrupt payments will infect the process, uh, and that has continued since Lanny left to be a, a significant focus of the Department of Justice. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Wendell Taylor, or good afternoon, like Tim mentioned. Uh, we'll start with a general overview of the FCPA, <clears throat> and then we'll apply it to uh, life sciences uh, industry through real-world examples. Um, as you can see, uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, has, has a uh, dual purpose. It is uh, designed to prohibit bribes of public officials, of, of foreign public officials, and it requires um, accurate books and records. You'll see the, the two seals there, the seal of the Department of Justice and Securities and Ex Exchange Commission. The DOJ and the SEC work together to enforce the FCPA, with the DOJ taking the lead on criminal bribery cases, and the S SEC uh, more uh, focused on requiring public companies to keep accurate books and records. Um, the SEC has jurisdiction over publicly traded companies only, um, and as such, uh, the books and records provisions of the FCPA do not apply to private companies. Now, um, 
again, there are two focuses of the FCPA, bribery and accurate books and records. And we've all heard the, the phrase, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up. Well, in this case, it's both. Um, I mentioned the criminal sanctions uh, of the anti-bribery uh, provisions of the FCPA, uh, but this goes along with uh, very severe fines and civil penalties for violations of the books and records provisions. Um, this is also the case um, uh, even if no bribe occurs. Uh, so, for example, a company could run afoul of the FCPA under the books and records provisions even if that company did not actually uh, bribe anyone. You can take an example of what um, is a lawful payment to a foreign official that a company believes to be unlawful and as such uh, does not record it properly. In that situation, uh, the company would obviously be absolved of any violations of the anti-bribery portion of the statute, but it could still be, if it's a publicly traded company, in violation of books and records because it did not record uh, those payments, those lawful payments properly. Now, turning directly to the first prong of the FCPA, the anti-bribery prong, um, and it applies to any offers or payments, promises to pay, authorizations, et cetera, uh, of anything of value to a foreign official. Uh, it must be knowingly, and it must be for an improper purpose. So let's unpack this a little bit um, first. Uh, as you can see, the bribe does not have to succeed uh, to be unlawful. It, it's, it offers uh, for bribes are covered, promises to pay in the future are covered, authorizations of payment are also uh, covered, and so the bribe itself does not have to be consummated. Uh, with respect to anything of value, I'm going to come back to this in a second, but I'll just say uh, at at this point that this is extremely broad and it does apply to anything of value at all. Uh, now, it has to be knowingly. This is a, a criminal statute, so there has to be an intent element, but it does not require the specific intent. Um, it could be uh, conscious disregard or things like deliberate ignorance are also covered, but there still has to be some intent um, to actually commit some wrongful act. And it has to be, again, for the purpose of in influencing an official um, to, um, to, to do something improper. And um, we're going to get to a, a little bit what a public official is, you know, what a foreign public official is, uh, but that is also very, very broad. And it includes things like quasi-governmental agencies, state-owned companies, even relatives. Of, of public officials. In the context of the life sciences industry, um, it's most applicable to the company's interactions with, say, governmental doctors. Um, and so we will say more on that later, but uh, foreign official is, again, uh, very broad as the anything of value is broad as well. Now, thing of value versus the exceptions. And I, we, we, we put this together because uh, there are some exceptions to um, the anti-bribery provisions of the FCPA. Um, and you know sometimes things of value are given to foreign officials that uh, do not run afoul of the FCPA. But when you're looking at what is uh, and is not a thing of value, uh, it is defined very broadly even the even de minimis payments uh, could be uh, volatile of the FCPA, uh, and again, it may include offers or promises, even if no payment is made. And when you think about the actual things that are covered, um, it can be anything you can think of: gifts and entertainment, professional training, charitable contributions to a public official's favorite charity hospitality expenses, you know, trips, et cetera, uh, even loans, things that you intend to get back would be considered a thing of value under the FCPA. Um, and obviously cash, um, you know, maybe we should put that one first, but obviously cash is certainly covered as well, and even educational or employment opportunities. So um, you, you can't provide a foreign official with 
um, uh, a, a promise for a job after after they leave office in exchange for something improper under the FCPA. Uh, so those are things of value. And now I'll turn to some of the exceptions to the anti-bribery portion of the statute. Now, there are, there are two main things that are exceptions. One, which is, um, is decreasing in its use. But first, I'll start with reasonable and bona fide promotional expenses. If you've got products that you would like a foreign official to test, or um, you know some some sort of uh, mechanism that requires you to promote uh, your product. Those things are not covered by the FCPA and would not be um, you know covered by the anti-bribery portion of it. Uh, beware though that um, it requires proper documentation of what those expenses were for, and the more times it's done, obviously. Uh, the more scrutiny one would get. But there is a portion of the FCPA anti-bribery provision that has come under question most recently, and it is the use of facilitation or grease payments. These are payments to foreign officials uh, for routine governmental action, such as processing paper, issuing permits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these things can be done in order to expedite the performance of non-discretionary duties which the officials already have are, are, are bound to perform. The problem is it's a very slippery slope. Um, and so if you advise your employees that certain types of payments to foreign officials are lawful, then you, know, you are leaving it up to their discretion to figure out what is lawful and what is not. Um, even though these things are lawful, the pendulum has swung completely in the direction of companies advising their employees to not pay facilitation or grease payments, even though the FCPA allows it. The reason the FCPA is okay with this generally is because in certain countries, these type payments are almost necessary for those governmental actors to do even routine actions. And it would cause a great headwind on our U.S. companies if these things were not allowed. Again, the problem is with the fact that there is a slippery slope, and once you start giving payments like this, um, you know, it could lead you into areas that are not lawful under the FCPA. Again, even though the FCPA um, uh, has a, a, a carve-out for facilitation payments, the FCPA resource guide itself, and I'll quote, encourages companies to prohibit or discourage facilitation uh, payments. So it is allowed, but it is discouraged by uh, the FCPA resource guide itself. And this is a publication that's put out by the SEC and DOJ uh, together. There is one example. There is a SEC case versus uh, Summers, SEC v. Summers, where a $30,000 payment was made to an employee of a Venezuelan state-owned oil company to secure uh, overdue payments for which the services had already been rendered. So this is money that was actually owed to this, to this uh, company um, by the state-owned oil company, and the payment was made only to expedite the payment. Now, the SEC sued, and although uh, Mr. Summers may have uh, come out okay, um, this, this, this case settled. And so even if there are lawful facilitation payments. It doesn't mean that you won't be sued by the SEC or, or DOJ. And in that case, you may uh, have to justify your use of these type of payments. And again, I will say again that the pendulum has swung um, in the direction of not using these f facilitation payments at all. Now, generally speaking, the consequences of the FCP of FCPA violations are extreme, and they come in the in the in the form of of, of, of various types of uh, consequences. One, obviously, fines to the company. Uh, the costs of the investigation can be extreme. Uh, jail sentences to individuals who violate the act. Um, loss of licenses and other privileges. Uh, collateral civil litigation by private litigants. Uh, there's obviously a reputational damage that could occur, 
And oftentimes the government appoints monitors to monitor companies after these type violations, which could create uh, huge headwinds on the company. Um, and this is one of the reasons why companies shy away from facilitation payments because uh, they could be staring at these type of consequences um, if they run afoul of the FCPA. I will just point out that the cost of the investigation um, are, cannot be overstated. Um, there's a case of Walmart uh, dealing in uh, Mexico. It's, it's gotten a lot of press over the last several years. Um, Walmart reported that it spent $439 million in two years investigating its FCPA issues in Mexico. And that's just in the investigation and only for two years. And that investigation is ongoing. Now, the specific anti-bribery penalties are these. Uh, criminal penalties for individuals of up to $250,000. Uh, it could be five years in jail for, for willful violations, and the companies are not allowed to pay the fines on behalf of the individuals. Uh, the fines can be up to twice uh, the, the benefit, and there are um, penalties for companies as well, civil penalties of up to $16,000 per violation, uh, and also criminal penalties of up to $2 million. Thanks, Wendell. Let me now move to the books and records provision. Uh, I think this is uh, the kind of strict liability offense that a lot of people fail to appreciate. You know, the headline when it comes to FCPA is what Wendell's been describing, the anti-bribery payments. Uh, I think most sophisticated people understand that when you're doing business abroad, you can't bribe uh, government officials in order to get things done. The books and records provision is, I think, lesser understood, lesser known, but equally as important. It's an SEC provision. As Wendell said in the beginning, the FCPA is enforced both by the Department of Justice and by the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the books and records provision is the exclusive focus of the SEC. And it only applies as a result to publicly traded companies. Um, under the books and records provision, if a company reports to the SEC, has exchange traded American depository receipts, uh, has stock trade, it, it, it stock trades over the counter, and has false or inaccurate books or records, or fails to maintain a system of internal accounting controls, then it could be viewed to have violated the books and records provision. The key here is the record keeping of any payments made uh, overseas is crucial. Uh, the specific language, publicly traded companies must make and keep books, records, and accounts which in reasonable detail accurately and fairly reflect the transactions and dispositions of the assets of the issuer. Um, and in it, this is both a criminal and a civil violation. In a criminal case, there's a willfulness requirement, much like the anti-bribery provision. Uh, if there's going to be a criminal books and records case, we ha the government would have to show that the individual purposefully uh, made an inaccurate record or failed to keep records that were required under the statute. Uh, and in a criminal case against a company, the government doesn't have to prove willfulness. Against a company, this could be simply a, uh, a systematic uh, but unintentional uh, inability to keep accurate records. And then finally, in a civil case against the company, the government needs only prove that the record at issue was subject to the record keeping provision and the record was some somehow inaccurate, something that a prudent record keeper would have deemed unsatisfactory. That again is a strict liability provision and could result in substantial civil exposure for the company. Penalties, uh, criminal penalties, $5 million or twice the gain or loss caused by the, vi the, by the violation. And that's very, again, similar to what Wendell said with respect to anti-bribery. The government will try to quantify the value of the violation, and under the statute, the fine could be twice that, and that is oftentimes the subject of a negotiation. It's a 20-year offense for a willful violation, and then for civil liability could be had for aiding and abetting or causing a company's violation of the accounting provisions. Those are, that's the, for individuals. And then for companies, it's a $25 million fine per offense 
or again, twice the gain or loss, and civil proceedings may result in fines or disgorgement equal to the amount of the gain. Let me turn it back to Wendell now to talk to you about some specific areas of the world that have been identified as having substantial risk. Thanks, Tim. So one of the first things companies should do when they are attempting to assess their FCPA risk is to determine in what countries they're doing business and to look at some of the resources that are available which determine um, how risky acting in those countries could be. This information here is pulled from uh, the Transparency International's uh, Corruption Perceptions Index, and this is 2014. This, this, this organization puts out uh, a map like this every year which um, helps to kind of quantify what your um, corruption risk is in certain countries. This does not directly apply to the FCPA itself, but in dealing with countries that are more corrupt, um, you could, uh, you know, you could figure out that uh, you, you would probably have more of an FCPA risk in those countries. And as you can see here, there's a, there's a scale. It goes from you know, highly corrupt to, to very clean, whereas the kind of deepest red are, are highly corrupt, and then the, the bright yellow are the, are the most clean. Um, and so a high score is good in that you would have less of a, an FCPA risk in those countries, and a really low score would, would be bad. There is one other um, resource material that I will point you to that I mentioned earlier, and it's the DOJ's and SEC's FCPA resource guide, which also gives great information about the focus of the regulators and the um, you know, types of things that they think are okay or not okay, depending on their experiences. Now, one other way to, to look at the problem is to, is to look at, for example, how many enforcement actions occur by country. So when you're assessing your global FCPA risk and you're in a country that's, that has um, uh, dozens of, of enforcement actions, yeah, you could um, maybe think that you have a higher FCPA risk in those countries. So, for example, if you're operating in China, you're likely to have a higher risk of an enforcement action for an FCPA violation than, say, in Italy. But I would, I would caution you to be, to be careful not to misinterpret this information. Um, while China has a very poor corruption score and a high number of enforcement actions, a country like Iran, for example, has an even poorer corruption score but fewer, uh, fewer enforcement actions than China. So in order to kind of process this, this information, you can't just look at the, the number of enforcement actions by country, but you should also look at, say, the size of those countries and the um, size of, you know, U.S. activity in those countries, and then use that information together to assess the company's FCPA risk. One other way to, uh, to determine what your risk could be is, is your industry. And um, here is a chart of FCPA enforcement actions by industry. And as you can see, um, the life sciences industry is second only to oil and gas. And again, I attribute this uh, largely to the fact that the life sciences companies um, have numerous interactions with foreign governmental officials, largely in the form of dealing with governmental doctors. And so because there are these interactions and they occur so frequently um, the, that you know, life, life sciences has become a focus of the DOJ and SEC for uh, FCPA investigations, which is why we're here today. For our webcast participants who are seeking CLE for this program, uh, please transcribe the code um, exactly as it appears on the screen and include it on the attorney affirmation form that you received with the login instructions. Uh, this code is required for CLE verification. Uh, please return your completed affirmation form with this code to Heather May, whose email is hmay at hunton.com, hmay at hunton.com, if you would like to be contacted regarding CLE. 
Um, and also for your convenience, we will be recirculating the affirmation form in a follow-up email after the program. Thanks, Gary. So let's move on now to one general point that applies in the FCPA world. Uh, and it's new information. Just last week, the Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates gave a speech in New York where she reiterated uh, and frankly amplified the department's commitment to investigating individuals when it, when it comes to any area of fraud, white collar offenses. Now, for years and years, these FCPA cases, and we're going to talk about a bunch of them here pretty soon in the healthcare field, but, but it, regardless of industry, they've generally been resolved against the company. And that's true in a lot of different substantive areas. The company pleads guilty or negotiates a deferred prosecution agreement, promises to do uh, various things to ensure future compliance with the law, pays a substantial penalty, but individuals are not charged. That, according to Sally Yates in her recent speech, needs to change. Uh, there's sort of a policy reason that the department believes you won't get effective deterrence, FCPA or otherwise, unless you hold individuals within companies responsible for criminal conduct. To the extent evidence of such criminal conduct by individuals exists, companies have to disclose that if they are going to get cooperation credit. Uh, most companies that are faced with these investigations try very hard to cooperate in the hope that that results in leniency. Uh, after Sally's speech last week, uh, that cooperation must include the identification of culpable individuals, uh, evidence that individual executives were aware of, encouraged, facilitated, uh, these corrupt payments may has to be disclosed and may result not just in a resolution against the company, but charges against those executives. You can see her direct quote, but the headline of her speech, which is getting a lot of buzz in the white collar bar and, and in boardrooms around the country, is that individuals now have uh, potentially a target. And there may be additional charges in these cases, FCPA and otherwise, against individual executives if there's evidence that they somehow facilitated, encouraged, were aware, even aware of uh, the, the underlying violation. That applies in the FCPA area just as it, is, it does in other areas. Uh, Marshall Miller, who works in the criminal division, and the criminal division is where these cases are investigated, said something similar recently. Voluntary disclosure of corporate misconduct uh, does not to demonstrate, does not constitute true cooperation if the company avoids identifying individuals. So there really is a focus, a, an explicit one, at the department on identifying culpable individuals in FCPA and other cases. Now let's move on to some specific issues that uh, arise in the life sciences. Uh, we've seen lots of different categories of interactions ab uh, abroad which have given rise to FCPA problems. Right? Companies that make payments to state-employed doctors who make uh, prescribing decisions has generated FCPA scrutiny. Payments to government officials who have uh, jurisdiction over licensing or permitting is another area where there have been investigations. Payments to officials to win research or operating grants. Uh, the, the distribution of grant money by foreign governments is another area ripe for FCPA scrutiny. Kickbacks to increase business, payments to research labs, payments to win government contracts or support, all of those kinds of payments are what we have seen in the FCPA cases. I want to talk about a couple of cases that have been brought and resolved uh, by the Department of Justice, you know, criminal cases um, that were against large pharmaceutical companies, the Johnson & Johnson case, GlaxoSmithKline, and the Pfizer cases. J&J &J had FCPA issues in various places around the world where they do business. Uh, and they had a, sort of a multi-pronged resolution with the government in 2011. It's a little dated, but it's important because it shows a kind of a classic fact pattern of what happens in these cases and what draws FCPA scrutiny. Uh, it, was a, it was a big ticket in terms of the number. It was $78 million to settle civil claims bo bo brought both in the U.S. and the U.K., and criminal charges in the U.S. where their subsidiaries were bribing doctors uh, to prescribe J&J &J medicines. 
and they were paying kickbacks in Iraq under the oil for food program to increase their business. Again, multiple locations, all of which were swept up into an investigation that was coordinated between the Department of Justice and uh, the UK regulators. Uh, they paid another $21 million in criminal fines to the DOJ over allegations, and they entered into a DPA. Right? They didn't plead guilty, but the criminal investigation resulted in the entry of a deferred prosecution agreement. Uh, that is an agreement that the company signs admitting responsibility and admitting criminal exposure, but the government agrees not to bring those charges for a period of time in exchange for the company making certain process improvements and paying a substantial fine. The SEC also got involved because there were books and records issues. Uh, and the DOJ, and again, the UK Serious Fraud Office, uh, the allegation was that J&J &J units paid bribes to state-employed doctors in Greece, used the company's surgical implants for a period of time in violation of the FCPA, and that there also were bribes uh, for doctors and hospital administrators in Poland in exchange for state contracts. Uh, and then finally, there was an, an issue in Romania, paying state-employed doctors who agreed to prescribe its pharmaceutical products. So you had Europe, you had Greece, <clears throat> you had a, a multi-pronged investigation uh, by U.S. and U.K. Uh, investigators that resulted in almost $100 million in payments by J&J. &J. The GSK case swept in similarly a number of problems uh, around the world, in Poland, in the UAE, in the Middle East, in Lebanon, Jordan, in Syria, and Iraq. This case started by a whistleblower. Oftentimes, you see these cases begin by someone who's a current or former employee of the company who is the one that blows the whistle and notifies the government of these violations. Sometimes the whistleblower is, is filing some sort of litigation and looking for a payment himself or herself. This one, again, this was a, had a Romanian issue. Uh, the allegation said that GSK paid Romanian doctors hundreds and in one case thousands of euros in 2009 through 2012 for prescribing its medication, and including the prostate treatments, Avidart, Duodart, and Parkinson's, Parkinson's drug Requip. DOJ and SEC have investigated, and then eventually in 2014, there was a Chinese uh, component of this, a 3 billion yen, uh, yen $489 million fine by the Chinese government. This is the largest corporate penalty ever imposed by Chinese authorities. Here again, we've seen coordination between investigators abroad and in the United States. The same facts, the bribes in China were investigated by the FBI, anti-bribery, the SEC, books and records, and the Chinese government, and it resulted in a huge payment by GSK. And then the last case we'll talk about in the pharmaceutical area is Pfizer, and that is another case a few years old, uh, had multi-pronged uh, multi factual tentacles. Uh, they were, the, the SEC alleged that employees and agents of Pfizer subsidiaries in Bulgaria, China, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Italy, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Serbia all made improper payments to foreign officials to obtain regulatory and formulary approvals, sales, and increased prescriptions of the company's pharmaceutical products. There was also a Pfizer acquired Wyeth LLC, and SEC separately charged Pfizer after the Wyeth acquisition uh, of a, with a books and records provision. Pfizer and Wyeth agreed to separate settlements, but a $45 million combined payment. Uh, these cases you know, are, are large, but they show that the scope here of damages and exposure can very, very quickly add up. Let me turn it back to Wendell now to talk about some more specific resolutions. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so here is, is an example of a medical device company, Biomet, that paid more than $1.5 million in corrupt payments to government doctors in Argentina, Brazil, and China from 2000 to 2008. Uh, key here was that Biomet's executives and auditors um, allegedly were aware of the improper payments as far back as 2000, but failed uh, to stop the payments. As you can see, uh, Biomet did not voluntarily disclose the matters to the government. Instead, the uh, government became aware of the improper payments during um, a proactive industry-wide investigation into bribery by medical device companies. 
So um, we, you will see in a minute when I show another example that you know, cooperation and identification of a problem initially is always better than uh, the, the example that Tim mentioned, either a whistleblower uh, alerting the government or the government starting its own investigation and finding out um, the improper payments. Uh, Biomed agreed to pay $17.28 million in criminal penalties to the DOJ and a $5.4 million in disgorgement profits uh, to, the, to the SEC. One thing in particular here is there was a three-year monitor put in place um, by the DOJ, and the DOJ recently required that that monitor stay in place for another year. Uh, so again, a, a monitor in place um, could be a huge kind of headwind and, and be extremely costly, and it is one of the uh, mechanisms that DOJ and SEC use to ensure that companies that have run afoul of the FCPA do not uh, continue to, to violate it. Um, there is a, a recent quote by Biomed that says, based on the results of the ongoing investigations, Biomed has terminated, suspended, or otherwise disciplined certain of the employees and executives involved in these matters and has taken certain other remedial measures. So folks are losing their jobs over these uh, violations as well. Um, it also had the negative consequence of calling into question um, a merger between Biomet and an orthopedic device maker, Zimmer Holdings. Um, and you know, I will talk about the merger context from, from the other angle of an acquired company that has FCPA issues and things that should be done in that context. But uh, su suffice it to say, um, you know, when, when you uh, merge with a company, you are, um, uh, you are acquiring their FCPA violations uh, if you don't uh, do things that are proactive to kind of carve those things out and isolate them uh, beforehand. Wendell, let me jump in if I can just for a minute to draw a distinction between Biomet and the case we just discussed, Pfizer. Um, sure. you, you correctly pointed out that part of the problem for Bio, Biomet was that they did not voluntarily disclose these matters and that the conduct you know, that was discovered independently. Pfizer, by contrast, self-disclosed their FCPA issues. They had an internal compliance program that uncovered some of these, uh, these payments to government officials. And they went to the government, so it's sort of counterintuitive for a lot of people, but they went affirmatively to the Department of Justice and said, look, we've uncovered evidence that our subsidiary in X country has violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and here's what we've done about it. We did an internal investigation in which we have identified this, and that initial discovery led to other countries in which we have problems. They turned that information over in the cooperation process to the government, and they unilaterally, not as part of a settlement agreement, improved their compliance program, made internal improvements, and that all resulted in them not being criminally charged. As I said, they issued one of these deferred prosecution agreements. They didn't have to plead guilty to a crime. That's because they were proactive in identifying the uh, FCPA violations, disclosing the information to the government, and then taking on the internal compliance challenge unilaterally. Uh, it's not always the playbook, but it oftentimes when there is genuine exposure, when there have been corrupt payments, it can earn you a, a significant measure of leniency if it is something that is self-disclosed, flagged, and corrected uh, in the course of, uh, of your own normal business practice. The DOJ will look very favorably upon that kind of approach. Uh, and it can result in a in a better outcome, and 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 we see that in the difference between what happened with Pfizer and what happened with Biomet. Thanks, Tim. So now moving on to the merger context that I alluded to before, as Cubis Pharmaceuticals acquired Optimer Pharmaceuticals in late 2013, uh, Cubis recently disclosed that the DOJ and SEC are investigating the acquired company. Uh, because of a, a potentially improper payment of $300,000 to a research laboratory and a shared grant to its former chairman uh, in 2011. Uh, this disclosure is important because it represents one of the few times that 
payments have been made to state-owned research laboratory involving a grant um, that has been identified as an FCPA violation. The matter is ongoing. But again, back to the thing that's most important about this situation is the merger context. Um, you could have a situation where a company is completely compliant with the FCPA, uh, but if you acquire or merge with a company that is not, you expose yourself to that company's FCPA liability, especially if you integrate the two companies before identifying the problem. So it is, it is crucial that there is FCPA due diligence before the companies are merged. Um, you know, better would be to identify and isolate the problem in due diligence and then report it to the regulators. And at that point, the, acquired, uh, the, the acquiring company's assets uh, are not at risk. Only the assets of the acquired company that committed, that potentially committed FCPA violations would be at risk. So you would be successful in that situation in uh, walling off the assets of the company that had not committed any violations. And as Tim uh, mentioned, you know, cooperation with the government could also lead to, to some form of leniency uh, in, in that process as well. And I, I don't have information here as to whether, you know, when, when in the process Cubis actually um, identified the problem, but suffice it to say, if the identification occurred after the merger and after the businesses were integrated, then the entire uh, merged entity, uh, the, the, that whole company's assets would be at risk and not just the one of the two that had the initial problem. Now, finally, there, there's an example of BioRed. Um, this is a medical diagnostics company. Uh, the DOJ and the SEC made allegations that BioRed um, and its subs uh, made improper payments to foreign officials in Russia, Vietnam, and Thailand uh, through a French subsidiary that paid government agents commissions of 30, 15 to 30% in exchange for various services in connection with sales to the government. Now, the allegations here included violations of both the anti-bribery statute and books and records. Um, and the allegation with the, was that the company did not prevent or detect $7.5 million from disappearing from its books. They were fined $55 million uh, to resolve their FCPA violations, and this fine reflects cooperation. So here's one of the companies that did, in fact, cooperate. Now, what's interesting about this case is while the company might have technically violated both provisions of the FCPA, the DOJ seemed to uh, have little information that the company had knowledge of the unlawful scheme that was occurring. Instead, it relied almost exclusively on the books and records penalty, or excuse the books and records provision for the penalty, based on the fact that it found that the company should have known about the scheme and should have known about the bribes, and therefore it lacked sufficient internal controls. What was happening here was there was some low-level uh, workers at the company who were um, who knew they were doing things improper and failing to accurately record those payments, and the company itself did not have uh, proper controls in place to, um, to kind of root out those, those bribes. Um, the bribes themselves were recorded as legitimate expenses and sometimes not recorded at all, and the government found that the company should have known about this scheme or should have prevented it in some way. So here's an example of a situation where the, you know, the government did not say that the corruption rose to the C-suite, but you know that, that the company should have had uh, some sort of controls in place to figure it out, and they didn't, and they were still fine. Now, hey, Wendell, let me just add one thing before yeah. you go on to best practices, and, and that is that all we've talked about so far <laughs> involve government investigations, but there have been times when an FCPA investigation by the government triggers the filing of a shareholder civil case. We, we saw that in the J&J &J matter, for example. You know, publicly traded company resolves a significant FCPA matter with the government. Shareholders then file a suit saying you know, that the, the company did not have sufficient controls in place to prevent 
uh, the misconduct and given the fine, it is to, it has had a, a created damages to the shareholders. So even if companies resolve these issues with the SEC or with DOJ, they still are, have potential exposure on these uh, these shareholder suits. So I just just it's not really on point for the purposes of going through uh, the the issues here with respect to the investigations, but just keep that in mind as well. Okay, thanks, Ben. Now. Turning to you know best practices, like what what are the things companies should be doing right now to limit and hopefully avoid completely any FCPA risks? The first thing is high level commitment uh, that the business stays in an FCPA uh, compliant way, and in this context, companies should consider appointing chief compliance officer with appropriate oversight and responsibility. Also appropriate would be a code of conduct with anti-corruption policies and written procedures that are given to each of the employees who come in contact with foreign agents. And, 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 and these employees are trained on that and they're, they're, they're required to sign these type of information. These are the things that would limit your exposure somewhat if there is a violation that occurs. Um, you could also consider having anti-bribery and anti-corruption language in the contracts you have with with foreign officials as a way to you know keep this um, keep this idea in the forefront of everyone's minds that the company does not tolerate uh, bribery or corruption. And as we mentioned with the uh, the most recent example, the uh, that the, the company must have uh, robust a robust system of inter internal controls, including accounting and financial controls. These things will help to uh, identify any FCPA exposure and, you know, knowledge is half the battle in limiting that exposure. Yeah, and in addition to having a, a climate of compliance that starts at the top, in addition to having a code of conduct and your training, you have to, essential, to periodically do risk assessments and risk reviews. Uh, it, it will not be enough to just set the ball rolling with respect to compliance initially and then wait for some sort of investigation to respond. It's important to periodically spot check. You know, do these risk assessments, particularly in countries, as Wendell mentioned before, that are identified as high risk. A compliance program really needs to have a robust internal reporting system, it needs to incentivize employees to come forward without fear of any sort of consequ employment consequence or retaliation, and obviously there need to be disciplinary steps in place for employees who violate the compliance program, let alone FCPA, but, uh, but violate the provisions of uh, the compliance program. These risk assessments, periodic, regular, not tied necessarily to any sort of whistleblower complaint or call from the government, are going to be really important to the government when they're evaluating whether or not there's a culture of compliance within the company and, and considering cooperation credit. It's also important when you do get word that there may be an FCPA issue to do a really thorough, objective uh, internal investigation. Um, anytime one of these issues comes up, if there's a sense that it wasn't taken sufficiently seriously, if it was essentially ignored or, or, or even not as aggressively looked into as it should be, uh, that will be difficult for the company to overcome when it comes to a negotiation. Uh, and then finally, as Wendell mentioned before, you can inherit FCPA issues uh, through subsidiaries that are acquired uh, through mergers. So before joint ventures or mergers are established, it's really important to do pre-acquisition due diligence and make sure that you're not buying uh, or joining with an existing FCPA problem. And we'll conclude with uh, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, from former, former U.S. Deputy Attorney General Paul McNulty, if you think compliance is expensive, try noncompliance. Um, with that, um, thank you very much, uh, Tim and Wendell. Um, we, will, uh, we will turn to questions that we've received during the course of the program. Tim, you want to start with the first? Yeah, we do have a, a question about the new leadership at the Department of Justice and whether or not there's any, can anything we can divine thus far 
about uh, new directions in FCPA. Um, the, the predicate of the question is uh, that there's obviously a new attorney general and a new deputy attorney general that have only been on the job for less than a year. I don't think that the change in personnel that Loretta Lynch or Sally Yates um, are, uh, that makes any difference in terms of the department's commitment to FCPA enforcement. Um, a little bit of background, within the Department of Justice, the FCPA cases are all investigated by the fraud section, and there's a particular deputy, his name is Patrick Stokes, and he's in charge of the FCPA unit. This is a real specialty, and these cases are, uh, are infrequently done, or infrequently have any involvement by U.S. attorneys in the field. They're almost all done exclusively by people in the fraud section in the FCPA unit. There are times when a big office out in the field will do a case with someone from the FCPA unit, but Washington's always involved, and Patrick Stokes is the institutional knowledge. He goes back. Uh, he's been there now over, I think he's been there about two years, but worked in the unit before that. So the career folks don't change regardless of who's the attorney general or the deputy attorney general. Uh, Loretta and Sally are both former U.S. attorneys and former assistant U.S. attorneys uh, and friends of mine, and I know that they are straight shooters who will play these cases, uh, take them wherever the facts lead. Uh, don't expect that there will be any increased focus on FCPA. I don't, certainly don't think there will be any lesser focus. The only wrinkle here is the individuals, and we talked about that. The new memo that was issued last week does demonstrate a desire to, to look at individual charges. There haven't been a lot of those in the FCPA realm, but there may be some uh, going forward. But the overall department commitment to these cases is, is not going to change given the change in leadership. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we got another question regarding what is the first thing a company should do when it becomes aware of a potential FCPA violation? Um, I think the first thing you should do is to try to quantify the problem itself. You want to figure out how systemic the problem is in your company. And the goal there is to you know, isolate the problem areas so that uh, it doesn't expose the portions of the company that are unrelated to those violations, those potential violations. The, the way you do that, obviously, is to interview uh, the folks who are, who are in those units where, where there seems to be a problem. You know, once, you are, once you've quantified the problem, uh, then you can work on fixing it. Uh, but again, the first step would be figuring out how widespread that problem is through your organization. Uh, and you've got to be very diligent to, to do that quickly. Uh, so that it, it doesn't expose the company to even greater liability. All right. Well, I think uh, those are all the questions. I want to thank everyone again for dialing in and participating in our webinar. Uh, please be on the lookout for a follow-up email containing a copy of today's slides, a link to the recording, and also information regarding CLE. Thank you very much.